Well, fantastic to have you all here. We are uh, almost done with speeches. We, have, uh, we also have Secretary General Stoltenberg and Minister Chaputovich welcoming, oh, joining us in about an hour. But the format of the discussion, I hope to keep it as informal as this occasion and uh, this beautiful place can allow us. So I want to jump right in and start with you, uh, Madam Secretary. You have so much to say about both history and, uh, and, and what NATO was, is, and, and should be. But I, I, you know, the first question I really wanted to ask you is, you know, this was, we now think that, that NATO enlargement was a, was a given. It was, you know, it seems like a no-brainer from historical perspective, but we know that back then this was quite a controversial uh, uh, decision yesterday in Natolin. Um, you mentioned that quite you know, very senior voices were uh, opposing this at first. So how did it happen? How did it happen on your side of the pond? How did we tweak and then change and bend the history in a direction that allowed for this historical uh, enlargement, something that benefits all of us here in the room? Madam Secretary. Well, thank you, and I'm delighted to be here on this uh, terrific occasion. I love celebrating birthdays, especially this one, and so I'm very glad, and I, and I thank you, and Madam Ambassador, thank you very much for your kind words, and thank you so much for representing the United States so well here. Thank you. Um, well, let me just say, it was interesting, and I will tell this from a personal perspective, um, the discussion about NATO enlargement was beginning uh, before the Clinton administration came in, and there were talks about how to do it. And I specifically, I was ambassador at the United Nations, and I thought, if I start pushing for this, it will look like favoritism, since I'm from the region. And so I actually didn't take part in the early discussions of it, and I was very glad that there were people in the administration that were talking about it. Ron Asmus, as you pointed out, and then Strobe Talbot. Um, and, uh, and really, President Clinton was very interested in it. What did happen was that I was a part of the story because even as ambassador to the UN, I was asked to come with General Shalikashvili to uh, come to Warsaw to talk about the fact, not yet, um, <clears throat> which was that uh, even though there were plans that ultimately there would be an enlargement of NATO, that um, it would first have to begin with the partnership for peace. So we did come here and, and had a meeting with President Owensa and told him that, and he wasn't very happy um, because he felt that it needed to be immediate. Uh, and so we did have an interesting time because um, I was able to say it's an accident of history that two of the people that are members of what is known as the Principles Committee of the National Security Council process were born right around here, General Shalikashvili and I. Uh, and then I happened to say that um, it was important to recognize the fact that NATO wasn't a charitable contribution organization, that you really had to participate. But Voenza was not happy. Anyway, we did, it was a step towards NATO, and so I do think that it was the right thing to do because there were those who objected to it, who thought it was a bad idea, um, and some of them still object to it. But I think it was historically correct, uh, and that it was a really the result of some decisions made um, during and after World War II that had put most of the people behind the Iron Curtain for 50 years, and that it was a natural progression to have uh, Poland, the Czech Republic, and Hungary in NATO. And one of the great moments of my life, I have to say, is to have uh, been Secretary of State at the time that the Protocols of Accession were signed, and I signed them on Harry Truman's desk in Independence, Missouri. And I did say when it was over, Alleluia. <laughs> Hallelujah, indeed. Thank you very much, Madam Secretary. Let me turn to Minister Onishkevich. Minister Onishkevich is, of course, very well known, doesn't need an introduction, but you have been, of course, a Minister of Defense during the time of um, Poland joining NATO, an active member of uh, Solidarity, someone who was in Polish elites preparing us 
for, for joining the, the alliance. I actually wanted to at first ask you about your, you know, your side of the story, uh, your recollection. Why did it work? Uh, again, this was an uphill battle. Uh, this was not an obvious, uh, an obvious conclusion, even on, on our Polish and Central European side. Um, how did it work from the, from the point of view that, that you saw? Well, for us, obviously, joining NATO was extremely important because without being in NATO, uh, we felt that we would be in sort of a gray zone between NATO and European Union on one side and Soviet Union at the beginning and later on Russia on the other side. And being in this sort of undefined situation obviously would create considerable problems and also problems for stability. We were always afraid that Poland, being not well defined where Poland is, uh, could be kind of a temptation for Russia to restore this kind of relationship between Soviet Union and Poland which existed before 89. That's why you know, we thought that well, Yalta uh, situation ended in 89-1990, but the, the stability of Europe was not defined. That's why we were pushing so much for our membership. And there was obviously several items which we had to address. Uh, one item was, for example, the cost of enlargement. The, the, the other one was, will NATO with Poland be sort of a better? Will NATO somehow benefit from Polish membership. And, you know, to put our arguments rather, rather sort of crudely, I would, I would use only one argument which, which sometimes we used, the saying that, you know, if Poland uh, it has problems of military nature, of minor degree, then, you know, NATO need not to be involved. Poland, after all, is a fairly big country, can sort of sort it out. Uh, on, on its own, but if the problem will be so huge that Polish independence would be somehow in, in, in charge, in, in, at stake, uh, then you know, the, it is better to consider that the problem uh, when Poland will somehow succumb to this, to this threat will not be over, and it is better to somehow confront this problem with Poland 600 kilometers east of Berlin than without Poland 60 kilometers east of Berlin. <laughs> so that was more or less the, 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 the nature of, uh, of our arguments. Uh, and again, we always felt that we belong to the Western world. Uh, European Union membership obviously was on the card from the very beginning, but we knew that this will materialize Later on, that would require much longer preparations. NATO was somehow easier, f practically, <laughs> to achieve. Uh, and NATO, our membership in NATO would firmly anchor Poland uh, in, in, in a, one of the basic Euro-Atlantic uh, institutions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, let me turn to Sir Malcolm Rifkind. You were uh, a sec Foreign Secretary and Defense Secretary in the run-up to the decision of the, of the alliance to, to invite Poland, Czech Republic, and, and Hungary. You were one of the champions of the, of the idea. And uh, you know, I would ask you from the British perspective, but maybe a little bit more, I mean, from, the, from our allies from the, from the West. Um, you know, because this was also not necessarily a, 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 a smooth sailing. If you could bring for us the debates that were going at that time, both in London, but also in Brussels, in Berlin, in Paris, um, and, uh, and, and, and the thinking that in the end um, resulted in, uh, in the birthday that we are celebrating today. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to this conference. I'd like, if I may, just to begin by paying tribute to Janusz Onishkiewicz, because Janusz and I first met uh, when Solidarity was a banned organization, and we met in the British Ambassador's House here in Warsaw in 1985. Uh, little believing that 10 years later we'd both be ministers of defense uh, and uh, all the other remarkable parts of his career. But to answer your question specifically, uh, the, the you're correct that the debates that took place uh, meant that time elapsed before there was a unanimity, or never even a unanimity, but a majority view um, throughout Europe that uh, NATO needed to be enlarged. 
Uh, and uh, essentially, when the Cold War came to an end, uh, the first preoccupation about NATO was not Poland or Czechoslovakia, it was East Germany. When Germany reunified, would the whole of Germany become part of NATO? Uh, and that was something the Russians didn't have a legal right to veto, but they had to be persuaded because there were a large number of Russian troops in East Germany who had to be withdrawn. So that preoccupied us, and it meant that other issues were delayed. And I remember visiting as Defense Secretary, British Defense Secretary, uh, the Baltic States uh, in 1993, a year or so, a couple of years after they'd become independent. And the president of Latvia was rebuking me, saying, why are we not allowed into NATO? This was uh, Latvia at that time. And I said, you know, you're going to have to be patient, Mr. President. If anyone had imagined that five years ago, a, a minister of defense from the United Kingdom would be visiting an independent Latvia, discussing when they might join NATO, uh, we would have been thought, all thought we'd be li living in a world of fantasy. So, I mean, the world has changed so dramatic and so rapidly. But when it came to uh, Poland and the uh, Czech, Czech Republic and, and Hungary, uh, I think there was never any serious doubt that admission had to happen for several reasons. Firstly, there had to be a complete reversal of Yalta. Poland and the other countries had to be part of the Europe of which they were naturally uh, a, a unit. But secondly, when, uh, of course, it wasn't just the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union had disintegrated. And that meant if admission to NATO had not been agreed, there would have been a huge security vacuum in the heart of Europe. And Russia, not just because of Putin, whoever was in charge of Russia at some stage was more likely than not, given Russian history, to wish to try to limit the independence of their neighbors. And it's no coincidence that the two post-Soviet states that have uh, lost their territory are Ukraine and Georgia, whereas the Baltic states and other countries in Central Europe, big problems with Russia, but they still have their complete territorial integrity. And I think NATO is a significant part of the explanation for that. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Sir Malcolm. Um, let me turn to Minister Szczerski. Um, I wanted to ask you for uh, your reflection from the, from the past, but, but, but also, you are someone who is currently in a driver's seat, uh, one of the driver's seats uh, of the of the of the um, Polish state. Um, a, what are the lessons from the past that you would draw for the current situation? And you know, I, on one hand, we we are in the process of uh, talking with our American allies about increasing uh, presence here, uh, but this is not the only similarity uh, uh, you know so what is what is what are the the lessons that that you would draw from the successful uh, campaign drive and, and eventual membership uh, that we can that, that we can use uh, nowadays um, in Poland thanks thank you very much I should be on uh, thank you very much I strongly believe in this metaphor of relay so I'm the uh, the last part of this relay starting from uh, from Secretary Albright up, up to, the, to the current times. And uh, uh, we really took the uh, responsibility of uh, me, myself, with the, helping my president uh, with the latest uh, uh, big NATO summit, which is the Warsaw Summit, uh, with, the with, with the extremely important decisions taken, uh, which was taken there in, in Warsaw about the adaptation of the NATO to the current challenges. So uh, we do believe in, the, in this metaphor of relay, that uh, it's really the same work being done since uh, so we took the, uh, the opportunity to uh, define ourselves the, the future and the fate of, uh, of Polish state. So, uh, yes, it started with uh, Madame Albright, started with Minister Nyszkiewicz and all those in 1999, and, uh, and we continue your path. So we, uh, uh, we try to not to somehow uh, overshadow your le legacy. And uh, uh, if I'm supposed to uh, say b b the, word, the, the, uh, uh, the lessons, first of all, I think it's very important uh, uh, to underline the, the fact that the membership of NATO was a consensual uh, position of the uh, political parties and the Polish society uh, from the very beginning. That, uh, uh, so we not only uh, should pay tribute to the, uh, to the political parties of that time and, and those who were governing Poland uh, in, uh, since 1989, but also to the, to the Polish society and all these uh, civil society movements that, was, that were firmly standing behind the, uh, the membership of NATO, like the Atlantic Club, 
and all those uh, who are advocating the membership of Poland into NATO and the NATO presence in, uh, in, uh, in Poland since the very beginning. So I think the, it, it's, it's been built on, on the po po social consensus. And that's important. Secondly, I think what, uh, what we should do and what is our com uh, commitment uh, to the le lesson learned from the, and driven from the, from the past is the fact that Poland is uh, keep on advocating the open doors to NATO. And I think that uh, uh, we should be brave and bold enough to, uh, to keep this uh, chance and to really advocate the, the openness of NATO to the future allied uh, uh, countries. It's, uh, NATO is still growing in the numbers. But still, it's the, the, the decisive steps, uh, 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 which, uh, which I think, in a strategic sense, are ahead of us. Uh, I mean, the Georgia, Ukraine, and, and this kind of strategic, really, uh, uh, decisions that uh, we are very close to in, in 2008, but then the, uh, the world reversed. And the world is more and more geopolitical now, and I think we should keep this, uh, uh, this open door. And, uh, and Poland is ready to share its, their, our, our own experiences from how to build up the, the social consensus, how to build up the political consensus, and how to uh, make the roads to NATO uh, uh, effective, uh, also for the, for the uh, we hope, the future allies of, of Poland to the east, uh, and, uh, and allies of uh, the future members of the, of the alliance. And if you think, uh, if you ask me about the, uh, uh, the lessons and the, the values we think uh, uh, are the most important of, of today's NATO, uh, I have this tendency to, uh, to think that in the free seas, uh, uh, concept. So uh, I think it's the most important that NATO is a collective. So this is a, a, a collective endeavor. So it's, a, so it's not just a mutual, it's, it's, it's a multilateral collective uh, endeavor. And that, that's very important about the NATO and about the alliance. And see it all, all, also from the, uh, from the Polish perspective. So I think the, uh, what we're discussing now with our friends from the United States, uh, to have a more uh, enhanced presence of the United uh, US troops in Poland, it, is, um, it will be embedded in the NATO framework. It will be part of the strengthening the NATO presence uh, in, 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 in Poland. So this is a collective effort. Secondly, it's a comprehensive effort. This 360 degrees uh, uh, approach uh, uh, that probably uh, Secretary Stoltenberg will be talking to us uh, uh, very soon. Uh, it is also our approach. And the third C is the, is the commitment. I think the, uh, uh, the burden sharing is very important. The fact that all the uh, countries are not only the recipients of the, of the uh, uh, support, but also we are ready to share our uh, troops with our uh, uh, allies. And we do it in Latvia, we do it in, in Romania, and we receive the, uh, the support from Croatia, from Romania, from the United Kingdom, from the United States. This is, this is important. So this is the alliance that for me is a collective, uh, comprehensive, and uh, build on commitments. That's, that's important. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. Let me let me make, let me sort of start where you where you finished and and ask also um, and we'll get to um, everyone in the audience and I and I do want to recognize uh, Ambassador of of Georgia and of Ukraine I believe so too uh, for you know with the with the theme of NATO um, enlargement and keeping the doors uh, the doors open it's it's a theme that will certainly be present throughout our conversation. But I want to turn to you, uh, Madam Secretary, and, um, and ask for your lesson learned for the current times. Um, I mean, um, uh, NATO is, of course, uh, uh, an alliance ba based on values. Um, uh, it's uh, it's an alliance that, um, that is thriving when the, when the link between the United States and Europe is strong and when the when, the, when the Europe is united um, as well. So if, if you could share with us um, your assessment of the health of the alliance and, and uh, the health of uh, not only what's on paper, um, because we can certainly talk about uh, the, the military decisions, but also how, you know, what are the politics behind it according to, to your assessment. And, what do we do about it? Um, I'll stop here. Well, uh, I do think that there are a lot of lessons to be learned. And basically, um, uh, it has been mentioned that uh, people and institutions at age 70 need a little refurbishing. And so I do think that one of the aspects is that situations have changed in many different ways, though I agree with the, the three Cs uh, in, many, in, in every way. For instance, at the 60th anniversary of NATO, when Secretary General Rasmussen 
came in, the heads of state had decided that there needed to be a group of experts to advise him. Every country named an expert. I was named for the United States. And then uh, Secretary General Rasmussen decided that in fact only 12 countries would be on the experts group, uh, automatically irritating 16 countries. Um, and then he asked me to chair it. So um, the thing that was interesting though, and just as an example of change, what we were dealing with then was what would NATO do when everything was out of area? Uh, and it had begun in the Balkans and Afghanistan, and what were the lessons learned from that? We also then talked about whether cyber attack was an Article 5 attack. Um, but basically, we were focused on the out of area part. And I think that what happened now, we're in area, uh, and that has changed. And it really does mean that there has to be some flexibility about the way um, it works, how it's done. I think also there have to be some lessons about uh, some of the procedures of NATO, frankly. Um, the silence procedure is kind of slow. Uh, the question is, is there something that needs to be done about the voting structure without creating second-class citizens? Any number of uh, structural aspects that need to take place. I do think that it is important to understand the uh, contributions to it. I think a lot of Americans don't understand that there isn't a pot that you put the money in. Uh, and that the Americans are not the holders of the pot, but basically that it is the amount of percentage of one's GDP that is used. I do think also what is absolutely essential and more important than ever is the, you've been talking about values, um, and that in fact if you read the NATO, the Washington Treaty preamble, it is about values and about democracies, and so I am worried about that. I really do think that we need to remember it might be 2% of GDP for uh, military, it should be 100% for democracies in a uh, alliance of democracies. And so I am concerned about that. And I have to say, frankly, I have been concerned about um, a little bit of a condescending attitude by Western Europe towards Central and Eastern Europe. I think there really has to be a full partnership and understanding of the countries. I also do think, by the way, Malcolm, I look at you and I think uh, the United States has been in the position at the United Nations where we were in arrears, and you, generously, uh, speaking at the General Assembly, delivered a line that the Brits had been waiting over 200 years to deliver, which was representation without taxation. Uh, so I know what it's like to be on the end of being told, pay up. Uh, and so I do think that it's important to think about how countries really contribute and what the lessons are and what, frankly, is the situation, uh, not just in 2019, but what it will be like in 2029 and a number of years where we, some of us will not be here to celebrate. But I do think that it will be very important to look forward and think about how to make this alliance flexible enough and real enough to deal with the problems as they present themselves. Thank you very much, Madam Secretary. And, and, and uh, if I may, I would already invite you to the 30th yes. anniversary uh, because, well, we probably will need even larger room than that. Um, um, Minister Onishkiewicz, I kind of wanted to ask you a similar question of, of, along the lines uh, to, to Madam Secretary of the, you know, you, you mentioned that, that we talked about the past, but also how do you see it in terms of the lessons for, from that period for, the, for, the, for now? And right before we started, you also mentioned that it would be interesting to, to talk about the relations with Russia uh, that were at, um, that were uh, that were there in the 90s, the hopes um, uh, and how they didn't didn't pair out, and of course Russia is one of the key factors in in our part of the world. Um, so how do we deal with both the values part of the alliance uh, that is in the preamble and some of the hard threats um, that we have ahead of us? Well, clearly, NATO is not only a military alliance of sort of various different uh, countries is, is, is as 
it was already said several times, the, uh, an alliance based on certain values. And I think that one thing which we really should cherish and work for very hard is to keep unity in NATO. NATO survived very many crises. Well, let me uh, remind you, well, crisis of 1956, of uh, the crisis resulting from uh, the, the, the uh, intervention in, in Iraq. Uh, well, uh, so NATO survived and got even stronger after that. What really now matters is to keep you know, this unity again. And against this unity, obviously, there are some uh, efforts, basically from Russia, to make kind of a split between Europe and the United States. And I want, in that context, to uh, uh, remind you the three Madeleine Albright no Ds. <laughs> no decoupling, no discrimination, and no duplication. Uh, and I think that this is extremely important to have that in mind because I think that what really NATO is facing now is kind of a new arrangement or more, maybe not entirely new but much more comprehensive arrangement of the relations between NATO and the European Union uh, and also between the United States and the European part of NATO. I think that these are extremely important elements to, 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 have, to have in mind and to work on. Uh, one of the this deal between Europe and the United States obviously should be commitment to this 2% uh, of, of GDP. Although, let's be absolutely frank that 2%, for, for example, for Germany means quite a lot because that would mean you know, adding to the German budget about 30 billion dollars a year, uh, which would be even practically very difficult to, to somehow absorb. So the German commitment to, to increase their military spending to, to, and half, to, to one and a half percent already means about 14 billion euro, uh, 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 dollars more. Well, but that's, that's, that, that's one thing. I think that what problem we could have in NATO uh, is a, a challenge uh, which was also indicated by CIA uh, report uh, when uh, three sort of main challenges were mentioned. And challenge number one was increasing cooperation between Russia and China. And how to handle that and how to somehow, you know, uh, try to uh, address this problem in the context of NATO-Russia relations. What is the danger is that, uh, you know, if we would try to somehow address this problem, Russia may try to extract certain price. For, for that, and that price could not be accepted by NATO. But talking about Polish-Russian uh, relations, well, we always felt that you know, we can begin uh, serious talks with Russia once Poland is in NATO, because it will be absolutely clear from what position we have these talks. We are, we are talking with, with, the, with the position of being a NATO member, so no illusions about sort of regaining some kind of a, you know, dominance over Poland. Uh, so when we, we joined NATO, I asked my military attaché to, to address, to ask Marshal Sergeyev, uh, shouldn't we have a meeting and talk about our bilateral relations? Uh, and the answer was that he's not going to talk to a Minister of Defense of new NATO member country. So I, invite, I said to my military attaché to pass on uh, this information that he gives me no other option but to work hard on second round of enlargement so we will be an old member of NATO. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> so <laughs> this I think is, uh, are the main problems which NATO uh, is facing and I am quite certain that you know, having in mind NATO tradition and practices, we will solve this problem. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. I mean, you, you focused you focus on, on the theme of unity. Um, and and um, I want to turn to Sir Malcolm um, and, uh, and ask you also about um, you know, this theme going forward. And, and we have just, you have just concluded, I was part of, of the Belvedere Forum where Brexit was, of course, discussed quite a bit. Um, we are three weeks out of something. Um, uh, uh, but if you could 
if you, you know, this is, this is something that is a, of a, theoretically and nominally doesn't impact NATO uh, immediately, but, uh, but it's of course a key part of European and Western unity. So if you could um, give us your thoughts on preserving unity of the alliance, unity of the West, um, at the time of fissures, um, and how do we deal with that? Thank you. Okay, I, I'm very happy to answer that directly. I want to make a couple of points before I do, Absolutely. if I may, arising out of what has been said so far. I think, first of all, one of the challenges facing NATO is the very consequence of the much greater size. You know, getting unity in NATO when you have 10 or 12 members is not as difficult as getting unity in NATO when you have two dozen members, and it's increasing all the time. So NATO is going to have to face this question. Does it only act when it has complete unanimity, or is it willing to act as NATO? Will it be permitted to act as NATO uh, if some of the countries, perhaps for very good national reasons, do not feel able to participate in a particular project? There's, there's no simple answer to that, but it seems to me uh, it, there has to be flexibility, more, much more flexibility, the larger NATO has grown simply as a function of its size. Uh, second point, when we're talking about NATO's role, we must never lose sight of the fact that NATO is a military alliance. And in democracies, military alliances do not themselves decide. The use of NATO is a consequence of foreign policy. And therefore, the question will be um, whether the countries of NATO sufficiently share a common foreign policy that they're able to use a common military alliance in order to advance that purpose. Now, there have always been problems of that kind over the whole history of NATO. Uh, I, I think one has to be frank. At the moment, there is a difficulty because on a number of significant issues, I don't need to go into the detail, uh, the President of the United States has different views, not just on the question of, of NATO, potentially, but on, on Middle East, on Iran, on, on a range of matters that we're all familiar with. So that is bound to be an inhibition to using NATO to its full capability uh, if the foreign policy on either side of the pond of the Atlantic uh, is not as much in harmony as we would like it to be. Now let me come to your specific question about the potential consequences of Brexit. I'm not going to go into the details of Brexit at the moment unless anybody asks me about them. But, of course, the departure of the United Kingdom from the European Union means that when the European Union itself is trying to develop a common foreign policy, the UK will not be part of that process, certainly not as of right. Uh, and one of the challenges that the European Union and the United Kingdom are currently thinking about is how do we find a way of not just the European Union, but Europe, if possible, speaking with a single voice on great global issues. Now, so far as the NATO dimension of it, I would ask people in Poland and elsewhere not to be remotely concerned. The issue about Brexit is not because there are people in Britain wanting to be isolationist or not fulfill their potential role in the wider world. It's basically about the degree of self-government uh, we are prepared to sacrifice by being a member of the European Union. I won't go into that further. But what I'd ask you to bear in mind is that not just for the last five years or 50 years, but for the last 200 years, long before the European Union was ever conceived, the United Kingdom, although we were an island off the west coast of Europe, we were never isolationist. We didn't involve ourselves regularly in domestic continental matters unless there was a threat to the security of Europe. And whenever there was a threat to the balance of power in Europe, the United Kingdom was on the side of those who were trying to resist one country dominating Europe. So when it was Louis XIV of France, we had the Duke of Marlborough and various other people involved in wars to prevent that. When it was Napoleon, Napoleon didn't want to threaten Britain, he wanted us to be neutral. We refused to allow Napoleon to dominate Europe and worked with those uh, ultimately leading to the Battle of Waterloo and the end of Napoleon. The Kaiser, 1914, uh, when he invaded Belgium, he hoped Britain would be neutral. We refused to do so. 1939, obviously a similar case, uh, when we first day 
along with others, declared war on Nazi Germany. So what I'm saying was, you don't have to be in the European Union uh, to be hugely committed and involved. And the final point I make is simply this. This all comes about what I've just described, not because we, we, we're just nice guys wanting to help our neighbors. It is because at the end of the day, our assessment of our own geopolitical interests in the United Kingdom in the modern world coincide with those of France, Germany, Poland, and other countries. There can be no threat to France, Germany, or the United Kingdom that wasn't a threat to the others as well. And therefore, you have to have a common uh, security policy in order to help deal with that. So, my very final point, the challenge is not NATO, our role in NATO or the relevance for NATO of our departure for the European Union. The actual challenge is once we get through the, the passion and the tension and the uncertainty of the current negotiations, is how we develop in some form of way an EU plus one, i.e. the United Kingdom, when issues, not, not every issue, but the global issues of foreign policy have to be determined. And when Russia and China and the United States are speaking with a single voice, can Europe speak with a single voice? I doubt if it can, unless the UK in some way is, uh, is part of the discussions that take place on the big issues uh, that Europe will want to have its influence uh, on the wider global scene. Thank you very much, um, Sir Malcolm. This is a perfect segue for you, uh, Mr. Minister. Uh, can Europe speak with a, with a single voice? Uh, how do we get to a greater uh, level of unity. Uh, one of the ideas that, that President Macron uh, this week put forward, but this is not the first time, uh, is the European Security uh, Council that would include um, uh, Great Britain. Um, uh, ha but the broader question, of course, there are efforts uh, within, uh, within uh, PESCO and uh, uh, to, to great, create also European um, defense uh, identity. So uh, how do we, how do we uh, um, create a greater uh, extent of unity, uh, both within the transatlantic alliance within Europe, um, while also managing the different uh, threat perceptions that, um, and different points uh, that both uh, Madam Secretary and, and uh, Minister Nishkevich and Sir Malcolm mentioned. Okay, let me say that uh, starting from the, uh, from the basics, uh, uh, what would be the, uh, the immediate effect of, of the Brexit uh, in, uh, uh, in the relations of uh, EU-NATO uh, is the fact that if the Brexit happens, the 80% of the defense spending in NATO will come from outside the EU member states. 80% of the spendings of uh, defense would come from the non-EU member states of NATO. That means the NATO would be, would be financed by non-EU member states uh, in, uh, in, in that, uh, in that uh, uh, number. So uh, that means uh, we have to do something around our own uh, uh, spending pledge and the burden sharing in Europe, because otherwise we just uh, keep on uh, uh, be uh, strong in words, but uh, not very strong in actions. I mean, this, this is the basics. Uh, if you want to really build up the European pillar of NATO, we start uh, simply realizing what we pledge to, to each other. Uh, uh, what, 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 just to realize our commitments, because uh, otherwise it's the, as I said, no, uh, if uh, the alliance, alliance will work, uh, but still will be financed by non-EU member states. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, and I don't believe the, uh, uh, the, the way forward is to build up the second budgetary line for the, for the ministries of defense of the European Union, to just to start, start up building up something uh, here in, in Europe, why we not still uh, um, realizing the, the commitment that we already made, made to each other. And, that's, and this is very important because this is the commitment made to each other. It's not the commitment made to the United States. It's not the, like a tribute to the to United Nations, to United States from Europe, uh, this, this uh, burden sharing. It, the burden sharing means that it is, it is our mutual commitment to each other. It is collective commitment. So, uh, uh, so, uh, uh, so I think we should start just by uh, realizing the facts and then uh, draw the lessons from the facts. And, uh, and uh, so this is, this is the point number one. If, you've, uh, if you talk about the, uh, the, uh, um, the way to build up the uh, uh, more uh, unity, I would refer to the, uh, this Bucharest 9 model, the, 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 uh, the eastern flank countries uh, uh, meetings that, uh, that we started in the Poland and, and Romania started in, uh, in the preparation of Warsaw Summit. 
And I think this is the, the idea the, this, uh, uh, of, the, uh, of, of this common position of the, of the uh, eastern flank is that have each of these countries have, has, a, uh, has a free choice of the strategic, uh, 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 I would say, line in, the, in a sense of, for instance, the, the NATO presence. So each of the countries have freely choose uh, its own, uh, 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 its own, uh, uh, to say, uh, level of ambitions. But we are responsible and we commit to each other to support these this individu individual choices. So we got enhanced forward presence in Poland and Baltic states, we got a tailored forward presence in, in Romania, and we got, uh, by the free choice of the, of the states, no, no NATO presence in, in, in Slovakia, uh, Hungary or, or Czech Republic. But still, we support each other in these individual choices. I think this is important, because that, that gives us this, the, uh, uh, the sense of unity, but in the same time, it gives us the sense of unity and the freedom of, of the political choices inside. So uh, I do believe that uh, what uh, Sir Malcolm Rifkin said, that uh, we, we, have, we are still, uh, I think, in, in, the, in the NATO, uh, uh, the, this debate is still ahead of us in the, in the way to make it flexible uh, and, uh, and still uh, unified. And I think this is, the, uh, this is the, what, is, what is ahead of us. And, uh, and the, uh, the last thing is that uh, I just want to say that from my experience in the, uh, in, in the current position, I just want to assure you that even if NATO is at 70, though, as Madam Albert said, it's uh, needed kind of refer refurbishment in the, in, at, this, at this age. I don't believe everybody needs the refurbishment at th this age. And we have a good, good examples here. But, uh, but still, uh, uh, if, uh, I just want to say that uh, uh, at 70, NATO is very much alive. And, and we, we uh, witnessed it, this, this, the, the fact that NATO is still capable of making the strategic decisions. And it's very much alive. Uh, as, as an alliance, and uh, if you look at the, the Warsaw Summit and what's, what was following uh, uh, the Warsaw Summit and the fact that this decision made in Warsaw was delivered in a year, it was a quick delivery of, of what, was, what was decided. It was decided of the has for a presence and the troops are there. So I mean, this, the alliance is very much alive and it's, it is, and it's, making the, uh, it's, it's able to make a strategic choices and it's, made, it's able to deliver. What, what, what was decided in, in the sense of, of, of growing and, and adapting. And I think it's, it is very important that even this, the fact that the NATO is very much alive, uh, it not only is alive in the out, out of area action, but also in, in this core commitment of defense and deterrence. And that's, that's very important for, our, for the countries like Poland, that it's the, uh, uh, it, it's bake, it, it came back to the basis, and in this basic uh, uh, commitment, it, it is alive and, and delivers. Thank you very much, uh, Minister Szczerski, uh, for pointing out that there really is serious of uh, the process of transformation that we have seen really from the um, summits in Wales, then Warsaw, and most recently uh, Brussels that is both providing, especially on our um, uh, flank of the alliance, greater presence, greater deterrence um, uh, of, the, of the alliance. Uh, Madam Secretary, I know you wanted to react to, but I also, before we open up um, to, 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 to the room, uh, we'll have about half an hour for, for uh, questions uh, from, from the audience. I wanted to, uh, I know you, you feel welcome to, to react to everything that was said, but also I want to ask you specifically about the, um, the United States. And uh, I don't want to ask you only about the President of the United States. Um, I do want to ask you about the President too. but. Um, it's, from, from what I can tell, sitting on this side of the Atlantic, there is an important debate going on in the US about its role in the rule-based liberal international order. Um, uh, one of the good books written about it recently is about Bob Kagan, who, uh, who writes about the jungle growing back, and, and really the question of whether US uh, has the commitment, has, you know, has the commitment to stay uh, as the leader and the pillar of the, of the international order. So I, I wanted to ask you this, this question. I know you've been traveling throughout the US with your book as well. Uh, one of your colleagues mentioned that you have gone to 13 cities in uh, three and a half weeks, uh, plus M M Munich Security Council uh, conference. So are, where is the US, uh, both if you look, you know, at the White House, that's one thing, but Congress and also just uh, the America that you travel through. Thank you. Well, thank you. I do want to react to one thing in terms of refurbishment. I think that we, NATO, has to pay more attention to cyber um, issues. Um, and that 
uh, the discussion that we had at the 60th anniversary was uh, Article 5 and cyber attacks, and people weren't prepared to go that direction. But also, I think, uh, given the kinds of statements that everybody's made about what the Russians are up to, which is um, hybrid uh, warfare, and the kinds of things that they're doing, especially in Central and Eastern Europe, I do think that there needs to be of a ramp up in terms of cyber. I found very interesting, for instance, that the Italians are suggesting that uh, the amount of money spent in the, the uh, budgets uh, has to be counted in terms of what is done against cyber attacks. And so I do think that something, that there does need to be an adjustment to what is going on specifically. And when it's always hard on birthdays to look towards the future, we celebrate the past. And so I think that is, is one of the things that I think needs to be said. I have traveled a lot around the United States and around the world, and um, I think that there have been times that the American people um, are kind of fed up in being in other people's wars. And the war in Iraq and a number of issues that came up then, why is the United States out there? And President Obama had been elected primarily to, uh, for many reasons, but one, internationally in terms of getting America out of a lot of the wars. I do think, I do not see the United States as a victim. I, I must say, I disagree with a number of things that President Trump has said, but that is one I don't see. We are the most uh, powerful country in the world and not a victim of anybody, but I do think that the American people want to understand better uh, what our role is in the 21st century. Uh, this may surprise you, but I, I am actually welcoming the fact that the political campaigns have begun because there are so many issues to discuss, and there needs to be a full discussion about a lot of domestic issues, but also about America's uh, position in the world. I happen to be still a believer in something that President Clinton said, and I said more often, is that we're the indispensable nation. And there is nothing about the word indispensable, however, that um, says alone. It means in partnership. And therefore, the NATO relationship is a very important one. Our relationship generally with other parts of the world, how we deal with, with the China threat, um, I think is something that needs to be discussed in partnership with others. Some of you have heard me say this, but Americans don't like the word multilateralism. It has too many syllables and it ends in an ism. But basically, it just means partnerships. And I think that's where, but there is a genuine question about what our role is. I found very interesting that 50 members of Congress came to the Munich Security Conference to show that there is great support for international cooperation. I have spent a lot of time on Capitol Hill, uh, most recently last week testifying um, in front of the House Foreign Affairs Committee for almost three hours where people were asking a lot of questions about what America's role should be uh, and are wanting to deal with it. And they are trying also to develop uh, a, uh, a narrative when they go to their own constituencies about why X place should care about what happens um, in some country far away uh, with unpronounceable names just to... Uh, get back to one of my favorite subjects, Munich. Uh, so uh, I do think that in fact there are questions and I think people need to be a part of it. And I also do hope that many of the foreign guests here, when they go to the United States, go and talk to members of Congress. Um, I think it is very important uh, to have those kinds of relationships and to develop, it isn't just relationships at the top of a country, but society to society, legislative branches to legislative branches. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madam Secretary. Um, go talk to your, well, not your, but their congressman uh, about the importance of uh, the alliance. Let me now open up to uh, questions uh, from, from the audience, if you could uh, we have mics. If you could introduce yourself briefly and please keep the questions relatively brief so we can uh, get to as many people as, as possible. Who would like to start? Wojciech, here in the second row. It's 
Unfortunately, my name is Wojciech Lorenz. I'm an, an analyst at Polish Inf Institute of International Affairs. Unfortunately, the question goes to Sir Malcolm Rifkin, or maybe it will be uh, a general comment. Um, you tried to reassure us uh, with this Brexit, and I appreciate it uh, very much, absolutely. Uh, although there is one fundamental weakness in this argument that the UK has always been involved in European security because it was involved, uh, unfortunately, at a time when we already had wars, right? And the European Union was um, the project that actually um, was to limit the risk of conflict in the, in the continent. So uh, I don't feel that much reassured uh, with uh, UK leaving um, the European Union. Uh, so, um, there can also be, that this argument can be reversed, that the UK um, or European Union did not work that well uh, for UK. It did not influence uh, political debate in a positive way, so that the project that uh, was supposed to keep us together and, and, and was supposed to influence us politically in the positive way actually somehow alienated uh, UK. So, I, I, I'm trying to look for some optimism in, in, in this, uh, you know, direction that when UK leaves, maybe uh, it will rediscover the political links with the with the European Union. And it will, uh, and it will be for for, for the benefit. But um, you know, it's a tricky argument, and uh, I, I would like to um, to give uh, uh, you the opportunity to. Uh, to give us something more reassuring than that, if I can ask. Okay, uh, okay. You, you, you said that you are uh, looking for uh, optimism. Uh, I was once told the difference between the optimist and the pessimist. The pessimist is someone who believes things could not be worse. Uh, the optimist is someone who knows they could be. Uh, so do tear up. Uh, you, you are absolutely right in your initial point, and indeed I voted Remain in our referendum, very much because of the overall implications or potential implications for, you, for the fragmentation of Europe. So let me try and put it in perspective though. And I, I think I'm giving an honest view here. The United Kingdom is not hostile to the European Union. It recognizes the historic achievement of the European Union in being, along with NATO, one of the reasons why we never had a third world war and why Europe itself did not involve itself in civil war as it did twice in the 20th century and before then. So that is not a matter of any controversy. If that had been what our referendum had been about, the result would have been very, very different. Uh, the reason why a majority of the Brits voted for Brexit was essentially to do with the fact that outside the 27 countries of the European Union, the other 150 countries in the world, including the United States, do not allow decisions that affect their domestic affairs to be decided supranationally by majority vote. So whether we were right or wrong, that was the issue, and that is why a majority of people took the decision they did. So the challenge is, okay, if that's going to happen, can we at the very least remove the implications for the security of Europe as a whole uh, now that the UK is almost certain to be leaving the EU. And, you know, it requires a bit of imagination. Uh, one of our great diplomats uh, 60, 70 years ago, Harold Nicholson, uh, once said uh, in international affairs that the worst negotiators are lawyers and missionaries. Lawyers because they say, sorry, the rules do not permit us to be flexible. Missionaries, because they say, it's a matter of my faith. How can I compromise on my faith? And that is why we use politicians and diplomats in negotiations of international issues. And if I can just give one example, very briefly, of how imagination can resolve some of these problems. When we were trying to persuade the Iranians to do the nuclear deal, the decision was taken that the P5, the permanent members of the Security Council, should have the responsibility. Very sensible decision. And then someone said, but hold on a moment, if it's just the P5, Germany will not be involved. And Germany is the largest economy in Europe, and when it comes to impressing the Iranians, uh, the German view on sanctions against Iran and matters of that kind will be crucial. 
So instead of saying, sorry, we can't have Germany, they're not the P5, we created the P5 plus one. And it worked. And it delivered exactly what was intended. So in other words, instead of being a lawyer saying the rules don't permit it, uh, or, or in convoluting ourselves with procedure, we used pragmatism and common sense, and that's what works. So all I'm really suggesting, and I don't think it's anything terribly controversial, and I was delighted, as, as you mentioned, that uh, uh, President Macron said if we have a European Security Council, of course the United Kingdom should be part of that. Um, our defense relationships with France are better than they've ever been. Far, far, far better, even over the last couple of years. So that is, I hope, uh, the reassurance that you were seeking. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, let, let me turn to, let's, let me take two questions. First from Ambassador of uh, Germany, uh, Rolf Nickel, and then Ambassador Dranga. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for this extremely interesting and stimulating debate to, to all panelists. I have one question. Of course, obviously, uh, security is uh, probably the most important element of the transatlantic relationship, and of course, NATO is the bedrock of uh, our security. There's also the other element, which is uh, economic issues, economic trade and other things. Now, we have some issues uh, in economic uh, the discussions at the moment. And my question to the panel would be, what, how do you assess the impact of these economic difficulties to transatlantic cohesion in the security sphere? Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, Ambassador of Romania right behind you, Avi Dudranga. Thank you very much. Um, uh, for, uh, First, a short comment and, and then a question for the panelists. Um, I had a, the privilege to be associated with my country's effort to, to join NATO, and I know uh, at that time, uh, NATO was uh, uh, holding, so to speak, the strategic initiative in, in Europe, in the Euro Atlantic uh, area. For some reason, since, let's say, 2008, uh, I think NATO has lost the strategic initiative. And I'm wondering what can be done to reverse that situation and uh, uh, turn NATO in a more proactive entity because, well, since then, I think we have just reacted to something happening outside uh, NATO. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. So economic part of the alliance and NATO strategic initiative. And maybe we can just address it to everyone who would like to uh, answer it. Uh, who would like to start? Minister. <laughs> or um, secretary. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, obviously, there are problems between Europe and the United States uh, in the economy area. Uh, well, the trouble is that sometimes in uh, declarations of uh, President Trump, for example, the European Union is seen not as a partner, but as kind of a uh, you know, rival uh, to the United States. That could obviously somehow uh, influence our, our our relations in other in other areas. Now, I think that the problem we may have is the problem with U.S. sanctions, uh, with U.S. sanctions imposed on Iraq for on Iran, for example, how Europe would respond, and sanctions used as an instrument of foreign policy. And as long as we will not actually somehow synchronize our foreign policy on basic issues, well, this economic instrument could really be something which will not be used in a very cohesive and universal way and could be something dividing us. And when, we, when I mentioned already the CIA report with the three issues which was raised in this report, one was Russia-China relations, the second was uncertainty of European partners of the United States. Uh, well, this obviously relates not as much to purely security area, but to the also economic area. And I think that this really should be somehow resolved. The problem is how to talk to the United States. Should the European Union talk as, as a whole, which I think it should, or should 
individual countries try to do something, there is an open question. I think you know, Europe should talk to the United States, and I do hope that you know, economic issues, although it, they might be divisive because of the rivalry, economic rivalry, it will not affect the security uh, cooperation. Thank you very much. Madam Secretary. Um, I'd like to go back a little bit on both these questions because um, I think that there were issues between Europe and the United States um, at the beginning of this century. And even though uh, what really did happen with the 9-11 um, events was NATO activated Article 5, which hadn't been done before, and any number of different aspects that showed positive support. But there really did begin to be more and more differences. And some of them, in terms of uh, the fact uh, that and it's uh, much easier to be outside of government than in government answering these kinds of questions, is that I think there was a sense that the Europeans um, were not being helpful enough in terms of overall policies in a number of different ways, and that there had been a hope that there would be a partnership between Europe and the United States in dealing with other parts of the world. Um, and in fact, uh, when President Obama decided to, whatever the right term is, rebalance to Asia, I, in fact, got many phone calls from my European friends saying, you've forgotten us, you've given us up. And I said, no, you used to be the problem, and now you're going to be the solution, and we need to do this together. I think people to remember, need to remember that the United States is not monogamous. We are both an Atlantic and a Pacific power, and there are expectations, and there's kind of a sense... Um, that Europe has not done its part, frankly. And so there is this question about how do we do more things together. The economic issues have begun to dominate. And I think, I happen to think the JCPOA was a good agreement, and the P5 plus one made it, and the U.S. Uh, undermined it <clears throat> in terms of withdrawing for, from it, and the question of sanctions and um, the economic uh, uh, <clears throat> connotations of all of that. So I don't think we're talking honestly enough with each other. And I think that's what really needs to happen. And to recognize how we can operate more together, I think the European Union for an American is practically impossible to understand uh, <clears throat> in terms of who's in charge, how many presidents are there, uh, you know, how the faceless bureaucrats in Brussels and so I do think that we need to figure out how to have more conversations about how we operate in the 21st century. Minister. I, I would just uh, follow the, the, this appeal for, for more conversation because I think sometimes I'm surprised uh, that uh, uh, some politicians have uh, been surprised by the messaging coming from the United States while it is coming constant, uh, consequently for eight years. It's not the... Uh, uh, some of those being, being uh, presented in, in, uh, sometimes in Europe as a new policy of the United States, including the burden sharing, is the consequent policy of the United States since the very beginning of the NATO. So it's not a new message. It's maybe it's, uh, the form is new, but, uh, uh, but, the, but the content is, is, is the same. So I, uh, so I do believe that we should listen to each other and, con and, and just discuss more, uh, uh, just to un un understand the, the positions. and. Uh, and for the economic questions, I would uh, refer to what Sir Malcolm Rifkin said. I think the economy is a very much the area of pragmatism and common sense. And I, uh, uh, so it's, uh, I believe that uh, you know, the, uh, the questions of, of economic relations can be solved in the, in the, unless we, I mean, until we, uh, uh, we are guided by the common sense and, and pragmatism. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's not for the, what was it, the loyal, loyal and missionaries. Economy is not for loyals and missionaries, it's the for <coughs> pragmatism and... Uh, and uh, and those are just being guided by the common sense. And in, in, if you think about strategic initiative, it's uh, what Mad Madam Albright said. Uh, uh, this, this beneath Article 5 actions, the hybrid uh, threats, this is the new uh, uh, area that we can really show the initiative. And I think this is, this is the, something that uh, is ahead of us, to show the initiative in a new sphere. Just to follow up the, what is, uh, what is the, the posture that is being, be, that's, it's currently being built up in the classical deterrence and defense, but to, to show the initiative in the, in the hybrid and the, in this beneath Article 5 situations. Thank you very much. I'm getting signals that Sekjen uh, Stoltenberg is getting slowly, you know, so we have time for, for another round, but I just want to make everyone aware of this. Uh, uh, Ambassador uh, of France, Pierre Levy. 
Well, thank you so much, first of all, for your very uh, enlightening uh, uh, contribution. This is a time, of course, where I think we all agree uh, in this time of strategic confusion, we need this, time, this type of, uh, of, uh, of thinking. And I, I, I'm, I, I confirm very, uh, very clearly what uh, Sir Malcolm Rifkin said about our, our bilateral relation regarding defense and how this relation is key to us and key for, for Europe. My, my question is the following. You under, underlined very well the, the continuity between uh, um, uh, having a, 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 some sort of common foreign policy uh, then uh, the proper military tools. And, and I, I must say, uh, looking backwards, sometimes you, ha you can have the feeling that uh, the use of military tools is the continuation of the absence of policy with other means, to paraphrase Clausewitz. Uh, and so I think there is something missing uh, now, at, at least to be, to be improved, which is uh, the need for common uh, assessment of our strategic environment and our threats. Uh, some look uh, towards China, um, some look towards Russia, the East, about some, some others look about the South. I mean, we, I, I do believe very much that we need to have a, 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 global, uh, a, a global approach. I, I know, of course, what is being done in the framework of NATO. I remember the work of the EPG. Uh, when you, there was this debate about uh, defining the new uh, NATO strategic uh, concept. But how the things are done also in the framework of the EU, but it's, it's, not, uh, it's, it's, always, uh, it's not always difficult, uh, easy to, to, go, to go forward. So how can we improve this to have a real uh, between, uh, between allies and between the West? I know that sometimes this word seems uh, uh, perhaps uh, undermined or, or, or critical, but how can we, can we, have, can we add this, uh, uh, this module uh, in, in our strategic approach? Thank you. Thank you very much. I, um, and the last question uh, from the fifth or sixth uh, row, because I hear that Sekjan is here. So, Hi, my name is Lauren Bedanovska. I work at the OSCE Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights around the corner. Um, my question is for Secretary Albright and, and all of you. Um, one thing that hasn't changed in the past 20 years is that you are one of the few women's voices around the table and in the front of the room. Um, I'd like to hear how you think women change the conversation when talking about security and what role women play in security in the future. Thank you very much. Maybe let's start with that and if I can uh, ask all of the panelists to then be um, concluding remarks and Madam Secretary. Well, um, I do think there are slightly more women than there were when I started. Uh, and by the way, my granddaughter uh, when she was seven, eight years ago, said, so what's the big deal about Grandma Maddie being Secretary of State? <laughs> Only girls are Secretary of State. So that was true with Condoleezza Rice and Hillary Clinton. And so now there are little boys that are encouraged by the fact that a man can be Secretary of State. <laughs> uh, so I think there are more women. I am very interested in the kinds of things that have been happening in the United States with uh, a huge addition of women having been elected to Congress, and I think it does make a difference. And Madam Senator, I was thinking, when you come to the United States, you need to go up to Congress. Well, and I think I'm happy to take you around, so I think it would be great to, to do that. Okay, and then Madam Ambassador, you're also proof of the work here. So um, I do think <clears throat> that um, there need to be more women involved in national security issues. Um, I think that it does make a difference in the conversation. I'm often asked if the world would be entirely different if only women ran it. If you think that, you've forgotten high school. But I do think it's important to, in fact, have men and women operating together in the very important national security fields. And I think that, I don't believe in quotas, but I do think that the more women that are in high-level positions, um, it's, uh, it helps the whole discussion. Thank you very much. Minister Anishkiewicz. Uh, also, I, Ambassador well, I would not sort of ad address the, 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 the gender issue. I think what Madeleine Albright said is probably quite enough. But I want to, 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 to respond to, 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 to the issues raised by Mr. Ambassador. It is really true that very often our threat assessment somehow differs, not because we simply are not aware that this threat exists, but about the sort of uh, the weight we actually attribute to every particular threat. 
And this is not a, a new thing if I say that at least in our part of Europe, we are not that much concerned with, with, with terrorism. Well, for, for very obvious reasons, we were not affected by terrorist acts or whatever. So we tr somehow tend to diminish this threat and we, for obvious reasons, raise the threat coming from the new sort of new imperial Russia. So that's quite clear. But I think that the problem is not that much with threat assessment, but with what kind of measures we should apply. Uh, how far we can go. As far as Russia is concerned, there is, there is a certain debate, uh, not very vivid, but quite clearly seen. Uh, what should we simply concentrate on deterrence or should we concentrate on rather attempts to build some kind of confidence measures? Uh, I think that both should be done, but this debate about the, 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 the instruments we will use the, is quite clearly seen in case of Ukraine. There is a big debate. Should we actually help Ukraine with supplying Ukraine with lethal weapons? Uh, because that may, according to this argument, somehow uh, provoke Russia, or shouldn't we do so? Well, my feeling is that obviously this is a big debate, but what we can offer Ukraine is kind of a land-lease perspective, uh, something which would copy the U.S. policy towards Great Britain before U.S. entered the war, or U.S. assistance showed to Israel during Yom Kippur War. So I think that the problem is with, not with threat assessment, but with, with measures, how to address these threats. Thank you very much. Sir Malcolm and Minister Szczerski. Yes, uh, first one on what the ambassador said. Uh, we know that uh, Mr. Putin ultimately is an opportunist. Uh, he thrives on hoping the West and NATO will be divided. Uh, I think the single most important objective we have, uh, we know that the vast majority of the US Congress, the US Senate, uh, US public opinion is pro-NATO. What we need is an entirely unambiguous statement from the president uh, that he has now resolved his inner doubts and is enthusiastically behind NATO and will continue to be. That would m do more to curb Putin's adventurism than anything else. Finally, uh, Madeleine, of course, we were talking about the role of women in politics. Madeleine was the very distinguished first woman uh, Secretary of State. Uh, I, I had the, the, the pleasure of serving for 11 years under Margaret Thatcher, uh, the uh, first uh, woman uh, Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. And I realized during that period that women have a very distinctive contribution to political life. When Mrs. Thatcher, in my presence, was once asked uh, whether she believed uh, in consensus as a way of reaching decisions, and we all knew she despised consensus as being wet and un indecisive. And to our surprise, she said, yes, I do believe in consensus. And we said, you do? And she said, she, she thought for a moment, she said, yes, I do. I believe there should be a consensus behind my convictions. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I do want to recognize Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg and Minister Chaputovic. We'll turn to you in just a second. But now for the final word to Minister Szczerski, no pressure. Okay, uh, just, uh, just uh, three words. Uh, to the strategic approach asked by uh, Ambassador Levy, I think this is just the two uh, basic conditions. First is the firm distinction enemy ally. Uh, and, this, and secondly is a 30, 360, percent, uh, 60, 360 degrees approach. That's the strategy. Uh, 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 we have to be, build consensus about 360 uh, 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 degrees of approach and the firm, firm and clear distinction between enemy and ally. If we reach this, that, that, would, be, that would be the basic for, the, for any comprehensive strategy. And uh, uh, to, the, uh, to the women in politics, I, I just shared the experience of Sir Malcolm Rifkin that out of four of my positions, three times I was deputy to, woman, to the women. Uh, uh, in the, I was serving for the first ever Polish foreign minister, the, the, the female foreign minister, Anna Fotega, uh, in my institute in the university. Uh, the heads of my institute was all been, has always been a woman, and uh, I was deputy uh, head of the institute. And, uh, and also in my party, party life, uh, I was always deputy to Madame Szydło, who was the, the prime minister of Poland and the head of my, uh, of my uh, regional uh, uh, party structure. So I was always deputy to, to women. I feel well about that. Madame. Well, I have to say, not long ago, I was on an airplane, and this man walked by me, and he said, so, you're Margaret Thatcher. 
<laughs> and, and, and I said, I'm not. And he said, yes, you are. And I said, no, I'm not. And he said, you don't have to tell me you're Margaret Thatcher, but I know you're Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> well, thank you all for joining us, for helping us celebrate the 20th uh, birthday, for raising the theme of unity, uh, for bringing the best lessons learned from the past to the future of the Alliance, and for helping us continuing with this relay Rays uh, of keeping uh, keeping the robust um, health of the of the Western Alliance, and now I want to pass the relay to my colleagues, uh, who will welcome someone who is really running uh, in the in the race now in a very active position. So uh, please join me in thanking uh, our panel, and I invite. <laughs>